Talofa, Talofa Lava. Thank you for the opportunity to send greetings from beautiful American Samoa. My apologies for not being there for your panel, but as you can see, I'm delighted to be at my home at Coconut Point for the first time in a long year of COVID precautions. I'm here for a very short time with a federal team combating a recent COVID outbreak and was unable to arrange my schedule to be with you live, so I apologize for these recorded remarks. Your focus today on the Pacific Islands and Oceania is so important. Since World War II, all U.S. policy in the Pacific has flowed from two national defense imperatives, keep the sea lanes to Asia open and keep bad actors out of the region. We did that successfully and things were quiet in the Pacific for a long time after the war. The U.S. dominated north of the equator. Australia, New Zealand, and France were the main protectors in the south as the Pacific Islands began an evolution into self-government and independence. American Samoa had the first non-hereditary head of government in 1956 when President Eisenhower appointed my father as the first native governor and nearby Western Samoa had its first head of government with the appointment of the current prime minister's father in 1959. In the mid-1980s, three events woke up the region. New Zealand elected a government, pledged to be nuclear free. A Vladivostok speech, Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev declared the Soviet Union a Pacific power and Kiribati signed a fishing treaty with the Soviets. That was enough for all the warning bells to go off in Foggy Bottom. All of a sudden, what had been an office of Australia, New Zealand, Pacific Affairs was now divided into three, with Pacific Islands getting their own and another of the freely associated states. Long stalled political status negotiations with the Trust Territory were concluded. Washington opened up USIA and USAID offices in the region and upgraded our embassies. And for the first time ever, in a State of the Union speech, President Reagan warned of the Soviet presence in the region. But then, within a few years, the Soviet Union collapsed, funds budgeted to support the U.S. presence in the Pacific, were diverted to Central Asia to support U.S. relations with the newly independent Soviet republics. The extra offices disappeared at State Department as the ANP office was recreated. Fast forward to today, the Soviet Union is gone, the Russians are preoccupied elsewhere, and there's a growing presence of China in the region with the Chinese Communist Party eager to fund projects in a number of countries in the region, including our neighbors in independent Samoa and the Kingdom of Tonga. We in American Samoa welcome talk in Washington of home porting a squadron of U.S. Coast Guard cutters in Pango Pango Harbor. Against this backdrop, you'll never be short of material for your publication and website. The Pacific Islands Matters for America, America Matters for the Pacific Islands, and the U.S. role must be thorough engagement. On that note, I'd encourage you to watch the Georgetown University's Center for Australia, New Zealand, and Pacific Studies website for the announcement of the lecture to be given virtually by my friend, Prime Minister Fiume, the historic first female Prime Minister of Samoa. She will be delivering the Peter Tolley Coleman Lecture in Pacific Public Policy late this month. As she also is Foreign Minister, I expect she'll have a lot to say that this audience will want to hear. Have a great event today. Make a positive difference for the Pacific Islands. And finally, I wish all the women on the program and in the audience a happy International Women's Day. Fa'aftai, soifua, ma'ia manuia.